You're listening to The Soju Sessions, episode 6, Growing Up With Eyes 1, part 2. Max joins me, and I really enjoyed opening up the conversation to Max's history. We get into universal coming-of-age experiences, the timelessness of music, the positive influence K-pop has had on him when relating to others, and hopes for the Eyes 1 members in the future. Coming up, Growing Up With Eyes 1, part 2. Two with Max. Joining me next is the mod from the UK, uh, a man with the sultry, velvety voice. Um, we have a one. Max, so welcome Max to the Soju Sessions today. Thank you so much for having me. That's a uh, quite an intro there. Of course. Well, now everyone can hear your voice on the show, and I would say that they uh, can agree or make that ju- distinction on their own. But um, we're gonna have ah. the next few minutes for them to really um, soak with uh, with oh. the auditory ASMR situation here. You shall have to me. Um, well, let's jump right in. So we've known each other on the server for about a year now, thanks to the pandemic yep. and the for- the bonds and connections that we've made with people on the server um, have been very valuable for people during this very difficult time in history, you know, with something that's so unique that's never happened before. And yet the internet has come to a place where connectivity is at its height. But this is kind oh, of take- yeah. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. No, you're good. No, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. Um, but let's kind of take it back to like your origin story with the server and kind of the internet in and of itself. Because I know oftentimes during our formative years, we get into interest and the things that we enjoy. So music being one of them. How did you discover music? And what were your avenues for some of your favorite artists growing up? Music for me, I mean, I grew up, as most people do, listening to the music their parents were playing. And um, my parents were of an older generation compared to, I think, a lot of people around my age. So I grew up listening to 70s, 80s music. Uh, And still to this day, my favorite song is by Earth, Wind & Fire, September. Um, And I just grew up on that, loved that. And uh, over the years as most teens do you kind of drift into your more rebellious stage started getting a lot into hip-hop which became a huge part of my music tastes and my character growing up throughout the years what were your favorite artists um hip-hop artists and r&p artists growing up that were very clearly forms of rebellion against like your family i mean it changed over time because obviously as young maybe 12 13 14 something like that you follow trends to a certain extent but from a young age i remember being white and being into hip-hop eminem was obviously going to be a key figure at the start at least and i've kind of drifted away from that now but i definitely say people like j cole kendrick lamar logic maybe somewhat have definitely been my preferred artists when I do eventually drift back into the world of hip hop from a my K pop pit. What's really fascinating about Eminem is and this is absolutely one hundred percent making me sound old and I will say this. I grew up when the Martha Mathers LP released oh, in stores as yes. a physical C D and I bought it. And it's just amazing that as controversial and as raw and like the most extreme like rap that rap music could get at that time i was living history and that his music has sustained itself and has perpetuated to the next generation and it's still interesting how like powerful his music is and yet so many people have been able to listen and experience it and experience it similarly how to how i listen to it five years later 10 years later 
15 years later, I think we're, we're at that point now with that LP. Um, when you listen to Eminem, was it something that your parents knew you were listening to? Or was it something you kept for yourself as a way to kind of process what was happening around the world and kind of like processing your like your inner understanding of how someone can get to this point in storytelling through music? Uh, I think at the start, I was kind of kept under wraps for a while, but I think I started playing it like at a speaker in my room for a while, played it there. They probably heard it in passing. And then I think over the years, I kind of started, I talked about it with my friends, but a lot more, and they're obviously nearby. So I think they kind of became a well-known fact that I was into it. It wasn't so much as a true act of rebellion against them, but more of a rebellion against myself somewhat. And music has that self-discovery aspect, right? Where um, in your early teens, you're still figuring out the world. You're still trying to understand how you're supposed to interact with other people. But then mm. with art, trying to interpret it, understanding how someone could get to a point of putting these lyrics together and then producing the beat, producing the instrumental. And the fact that Eminem put it together in such a way that's sustained over generations now. Um, oh, yeah. I think it, it's one of the... Um, I think it's one of the the marvels in, in music in the sense of it's it's such an encapsulation of like what music can do um, over the course of different life, lifetimes and lifespans. Um, you said that I you... Feel like, oh, go ahead. Go. I feel like with the age of the internet now and the accessibility to music from everywhere and from all times having these kind of timeless albums that are going to apply to whoever's listening to them at any point in time no matter if you're old young you may be experiencing the struggles i think it's something that is invaluable to anyone who can experience it so <sighs> definitely I like the fact that there are these kind of outlets to show in mainstream media that you're not the only one that's going to be feeling in a certain way. And I think you internalize what you experience really well. Um, you have a nice way of processing it, talking about it with other people, sharing it in a productive way. Not to say that Eminem is destructive in nature, but it's very easy to <laughs> make that is. connection, right? Yeah. It's, it's very easy to make that connection just with, um, with the aggression in his music. Um, but you also listen to J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar. How has the variety in hip-hop music kind of changed your perspectives and outlook on, on life and people and how you want to share that musical experience with others? Oh, it's shaped it massively. I think in my more formative years, I was not very savvy around issues around the world and issues with race, relations, sex, and stuff like that. But hearing stuff like the entire album of To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar is just non-stop talking about all of these issues that other people would be facing and how they shape other people and how those experiences kind of give me a better outlook on the world as a whole and I think without them I would still be in this very insular bubble of my own rather than seeing outside of my small experiences what was the most powerful message from that album for you i feel like it was generally about it was completely about race and how i'm gonna start again i messed up but i feel like the race aspect and the how he was institutionalized into his area and how he grew up and how it affects a person kind of resonates me because my like politically and all that stuff i feel like the way the world is currently having this kind of expectation upon an individual kind of indoctrinating them to try and stay the same even if it's not in the best situation for them that kind of even though i'm not experiencing <coughs> the problems 
firsthand, I understand that kind of emotion, which is especially now growing up, gonna leave home soon to go to university. I think that's definitely gonna be a key message for me to keep. With the music being based in the United States and you being in the UK, you know, our histories are very different. What is your yeah. impression about the US industrial system and how race till this day is such a friction, a high friction point for people? Um, because you're a person who doesn't live in the United States, what is your impression of how we've uh, dealt with it over the years? And I guess what has, how has that helped you empathize with those who have to deal with it on a daily basis? The problem is with racism, it's not a based kind of, it's not in a single location. So I feel like America has the same issues that we have here with race as a lot of very similar issues with racism. But I feel like with a larger proportion of the population having more extreme views, I find, in America than uh, than over here, it becomes more of an issue and more of a problem. Like here we have kind of extreme groups but they are the tiny minority but when you see cops as a whole not kind of a complete generalization i don't feel i wouldn't feel as safe in the u.s as i do here and i feel like having that kind of divide even though very similar cultures it's difficult for me to kind of put into words how that makes me feel so again, this is a very heavy topic, but you know this is what we do here sometimes. Um, with everything that's gone on in the world and kind of the visibility with race relations in the United States, do you feel like, like you said, like it's, it's similar in the UK? How do you feel like those topics are approached in the UK or at least the surrounding countries um, that are close to you? Is it? more is there is there a clear in the united states it's very clear that a lot of this is grounded in the history of how black people were brought to the united states and slavery oftentimes people don't like to fall back on that word just because it was such a long time ago there's just so sensitive. many yeah very sensitive there are a lot of connotations to it a lot to unpack for me i just like to use that as a, a starting point I'm not pushing yeah. that on anybody like that is your opinion if to feel one way or the other but in the UK and other parts of the world slavery looks very different how I feel have like you've been able to reconcile that go ahead I feel like I understand the issues with that in America but I think England especially we were the kind of key factor in why this has all occurred so and especially with the world and the place we live in today it kind of, especially here with some people getting statues for still doing horrific things, there's a lot of kind of campaigning and issues. And I feel like institutionalized racism is not always just based to black like America. This definitely occurs here as well. I feel like there's a lot of action that does occur here, but I don't think that with the older generation here anything is really going to change for a long time so i hope we do manage to make the same progress as i think america hopefully will in the next couple years but i feel like we're still living in the past a little bit and with the world becoming more globalized more connected like we talked about with the internet and the pandemic um it's just very fascinating that Another part of the world that is completely separated from the United States and the UK has now such a big influence in pop culture, in media, in economics, and very particularly in our life, that is Korean entertainment, Asian entertainment, and Asian artists. Um, yeah. how, what, is the, what is the overall positive of those experiences for you, and, who are some, and how did you get into it? How did you get into um, Asian musicians, Korean artists, and K-pop? I got into it because I, as much as I enjoyed listening to hip hop, I felt like hearing this aggressive kind of angry outlook 
all of the time wasn't very good for my already struggling mentally uh, mental health so i was like what is a positive kind of out kind of outlook of something like this in a music sense and i'd seen lots of stuff about this this k-pop thing i never heard of before and i kind of looked into it and i watched the uh, the peekaboo mv for red velvet and i just knew then that it was just going to be the next couple years just encapsulated just completely involved in that world what are some what are some of the feelings that k-pop evokes in you that are completely different from how you feel about hip-hop and kind of the aggressive nature of hip-hop i think happiness is one of them i don't feel like when you're listening to a rap album or something like that you're feeling happy i don't think that's the intention but a lot of the time at least with the performance aspect you it's very enjoyable you're happy watching it it's, looks awesome and it's just refreshing i think would be the best way to put it there's not really a thing like it in the rest of the music world how has this sense of happiness and this sense of different emotional growth for you helped you connect with others? And what have your relationships been like now that K-pop is embedded into your life? Honestly, I feel like I am. It sounds very cringy, but I feel like I am genuinely a nicer person now than I was four years ago. I was very confrontation confrontational not quite as soft-spoken i know i swear a lot but it was awful and so definitely having this kind of interaction with especially people who are maybe my age or younger maybe not in the server obviously but in the community as a whole i kind of felt like i had a responsibility to maybe not be as negative and kind of making the connections with people i there's obviously a fair few bad apples but everyone I've met on Discord and stuff like that will be an overwhelmingly just friendly, nice, helpful, and it's definitely been the real reason I've made it through the pandemic. And K-pop has that effect, right? Like the the whole idea of a collectivist culture infusing itself into its music and its media and essentially the reason why fandom is so big is because they want that symbiotic relationship. They want that double directionality where yes, the musicians and the companies, you know, train up their artists and they are so polished and refined by the time that they produce, uh, release music to the public, but they're also doing that to evoke a connection to evoke yeah. fandom. And I just think it's really interesting that you said that, that, it's made you a happier person. It's made you a lighter person around other people. And with without putting so many words into it, you basically said like K-pop has helped you appreciate relationships with other people and wanting to connect with other people. Oh, uh, for sure. What are some of your favorite groups? And you said Peekaboo was one of your first songs. What was your... Uh, what were some of your first uh, favorite, I guess, songs, groups, and like first introduction to the music, uh, to the genre? I mean, I got into, I listened to Peekaboo, obviously, and that was just mind-blowing at the time. I think it was more of a, I wanted to get into it, so that might have been the main thing. I remember I got into Twice for a while, and then uh, 2018... There was a there's a little little TV show called uh, Produce Forty Eight, and uh, the group that came from that I was one. I uh, just hooked ever since they debuted, and even even pre debut, uh, that's the main. I mean, since then, that's been my number one group. Uh, any other notable? Don't want to cry by Seventeen was my first the first boy group song. That I actually enjoyed which is a surprise to me because i know a lot of people on the server are still not quite at that point for with boy groups so yeah i think 
the the boy group thing is is interesting, right? Because as you and I are males, obviously. Yes. Um, but I think there there is still a different. We we seek different things with with K-pop. Um, well, I, for me, it's like when I listen to the K-pop music, I'm seeking kind of a connection with someone on the opposite side of me, which would be a yeah. female, a female group, um, however you want to put it. Um, but I do, I have come to an appreciation with a lot of male artists and kind of their process and understanding. Um, what are some of the male artists that you have come to appreciate and are very much a fan of nowadays? I never really go into the members of boy groups per se, but I mean, especially for the music, I really appreciate the, I mean, obviously probably coming from the hip hop roots, like NCT, 17, TXT more recently have been doing very, very well. But I feel like it's more if it's more of the more mature concepts rather than this purely cutesy one, because I feel like as a straight guy, that's not quite what I'm looking for in my uh, the media I use. Yeah, I mean, we all come to K-pop for different reasons and connect with different sounds and genres in different ways, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's totally fine if you don't connect with kind of the lighter bubblegum, youthful, boyish sounds, um, and you do lean into like the harder, edgier guy stuff. And luckily, we're <laughs> in an era where, I mean, that's the meta, so you got a lot that of it. That is the meta, yes. Um, I did want to kind of flip back to your favorite group and the show, Produce 48. Um, it's it's an interesting case study how over the past half decade, competition shows, group building shows have become so popular in Korea. And like, like I said earlier, K-pop is all about inclusion. S- more so than just being part of the fandom but now you're seeing these people grow up you're seeing the process you're living dying and crying with every moment that these people are experiencing to get to a certain height what was that experience what was that experience like watching produce and seeing the finer details of how the k-pop process works I had never seen anything like like it at the time. I was a little bit late to uh, produce 101 Season 2, so I didn't get to see that. But then watching it, it reminded me of shows like... Um, we have Is it X-Factor in the US? Yes, we do have X-Factor, yes. Yeah. So it was like that, but you see them all of the time, like throughout their day while they're training. And it's like... At first, I was like... It was like invasion of privacy almost, but was just kind of invaluable in creating this kind of link with all of the members in eventually making it into the group and those that didn't as well and it's kind of like over the past couple years with the people that didn't make it into the final 12 it's also been nice seeing them debut and then having that connection with other groups that I wouldn't have expected in the first place oh so the main show has brought this up in the past and I do um, really like talking about this or like focusing on this point because I think it was one of their most um, powerful ideas that they brought up on a show that's typically lighter, um, typically news based. And I think it was Doug who mentioned when like the reason why the K-pop life cycle is the way it is, is that when a group debuts at a certain age, they capture the audience for that demographic. So a group like Eyes One who in age you are very similar to um they yeah. are your peers and you are going through your formative years and you are going through a transitional period in your life as well there there does seem to be a parallel with being able to watch that and then forming that bond and connection how have you felt like their experiences are relatable to you even if like you guys are separated by culture and different yeah. worlds but there is something universal with the coming of age experience and i wanted to see what that was like for you watching it in parallel to how you were growing up i mean obviously my bias is Eugen. she is born the same year as i am and it's kind of this like you said like a parallel of watching 
both myself mature and seeing how she kind of has grown grown up as this or an idol a famous person i feel like that is definitely shaped how someone of that age would grow up and i feel like even though they're always in the limelight there's still such a relatable kind of kind of feeling with that transition into an adult from being a child I think like she debuted at what 15 our age yeah 2018 so would have been 15 and then now is going to be 18 this year so it's definitely a interesting way to see how both fame shapes a life and both how people grow up around the world in your opinion, how do you feel like these experiences of K-pop idols debuting so young and this essentially being their teenage years, transitional years, coming of age years in the spotlight will affect them moving into adulthood? Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. I generally don't feel like people should be debuting under the age of 17, 18. Because I think uh, like in most media, having this kind of limelight set on you from such a young age is never a good idea and especially in the most formative years of your life when you're meant to be seen in this very kind of set way like idols are in western media there's a lot kind of a it's a little more freedom you're to do what you want but i feel like an idol expectation is a lot more there's a uh, rigid Yes, so. yeah, it's just especially coming from a culture that is more humble and um, tends to have more collective control of how certain images are portrayed, right? Yeah. Um, there is a developmental critical period in one's life between the ages of 15 and around 20, where you do have that transitional period of exploring and discovering the world. And... You know, as much as we love idols, as much as we love the process, having that self-awareness that it may not be the best developmentally for them because they now have to funnel everything through a very specific lens, through yeah. um, essentially control of the adults around them and essentially and trusting that those adults are doing these things in their best interest. Um, unfortunate that we kind of find out that Mnet and CJ may have had different um, intentions. Um, again, not nefarious in kind of the sense that other people would like portray K-pop from the outside looking in, but still from a very um, money-centric point of view, right? Um, yes. How has... Well, so Aizwin has, has had a very interesting history. Um, for you, like, what was that experience like hearing about the vote manipulation and... How did that hit you knowing that you had formed this bond with this group, these members, specific members, and was there a sense of betrayal at that point? And how were you able to kind of push through it and see the members as people? I feel like everyone knew that Produce was, was a little bit dodgy. People already knew that before this entire scandal, but I feel like it being put out in words and the producers being investigated for it kind of made me went, fuck, this could be very bad. And like, X1 obviously got the cut. And then I was, at that point, I was really concerned that it was going to be the end for us one as well. But luckily, we are still here. But the other issue is, is it's punishing these people that have worked so hard and gone through this very difficult process in the show especially just that's not their fault and they're getting they would get punished for just corporate greed uh, just doesn't sit well at all i mean it's a very heavy moment in the lives of all these people right but oh, definitely. granted we still do have content from them and it yes. seems like they have been able to turn that page in their life even if that content is somewhat um, staged, however you want to, however you want to describe YouTube content and yeah. uh, variety shows, I mean, we, I think we we all understand the illusion of K-pop from that sense, and I think you and I yeah. are pretty 
realistic about like what they choose to portray and how they choose to be. But I still like to believe that these people are close to as happy as they portray to be on all the content that they that they share with us. Yeah, um, I hope so. With that said, um, what are some of your favorite moments and what are some of the happier moments in Eyes One's history for you? I feel like even though it was painful to watch at the time, obviously the, the finals of Produce, seeing all the members make it into the group, it was a bit of a tears fest, both uh, at the stage at the concert area, wherever they did it, and uh, in my household. Um, debut, obviously, was just pure elation. Every single comeback has been just excitement. I, I never wake up early, but I remember for Fiesta, it was... Uh, on a week off on a Monday I think it was the 17th of February and it was the only day I've ever woken up on in a holiday before midday I woke up at 9am and I was waiting there just refreshing my page and it was just even though it was such an odd experience it was I remember it with such fondness and it's those kind of memories that you kind of make because of a group, maybe not with a group all the time, that kind of have definitely stuck with me for a while. There is something special about forming that bond and giving yourself something to look forward to. Um, and an OK Pop has a very unique way of allowing entry into the lives of people. Um, I know, like, if we zoom out, we can see and be realistic that we don't have the immediate impact and effect um, that we have on the people that we experience every day. But I'd like to think that yeah. experiencing things and perpetuating positivity is a net positive in the world. I think we still can all do a better job of treating each other better, but it also starts from b making foundational pieces of how we dedicate ourselves, how we look positively on things that should be detached from us, but we gain an affection and we bond with it. And with all of this processing and all this um, emotional development you've had with a group, do you feel like that has, well, how do you feel like that has helped you form bonds and friendships with the folks on the Soju Talk server? And who are some of your regulars with regards to simping <laughs> and uh, just going freaking out of control? I mean, we've got a very good uh, Wiz1 community in the server. I think the Hogwarts channel, if you're not there, you're not quite with it, you should be there. But uh, I'm just, I was just looking at it now and seeing some messages about the disbandment. I need to think happy thoughts. Uh, definitely, I used to simp a lot with OP before he betrayed me for Che1. That was always a good time. Uh, Jacob, obviously, Mina, Mao, pretty much everyone in that Mila as well it just everyone is always so excited no matter what it's just and it kind of the more excited I see people the more excited I see get myself kind of and having people to share those experiences with is definitely a, an amazing thing the mic is yours tell us the OP and betrayal story one day I had woken up i think it was during the uh the fiesta kind of promotional period and i saw a message from a cambodian gentleman known as op and uh, saying that he was gonna change his biases and uh i thought i was a, i thought it was a joke at first i think it was around when april fools was i'm not 100 percent sure but i think you i thought he was a little bit early but no, the man committed to the cause and I've never felt so betrayed in my life and I still haven't let it go. It's, and I won't ever. Uh, never forgiven him to this day. So if you could play armchair psychologist, what what do you feel like motivated him to making this change? And you clearly see it as a mistake. Why do you see it as oh, a mistake? Understand. It was a mistake because he chose, he met, changed from the best member to one of the best members I think uh, there's it, a safe choice no matter who you choose but as for the reasons the reason was a haircut that's literally it because she got short hair 
simp just changed immediately and I feel like it's very fickle to just follow someone based purely upon uh, the length of their hair and you can use that throughout life with uh, many things but you can keep it at face value as well you know one day perhaps OP will tell his side of the story but for now uh, it'll be your side and I love living in this canon so um, Perfect. thank you for sharing that amazing story um, oh. I do kind of want to jump off of that as well to say that uh, we form our biases in K-pop. That is a very common practice with fandom. And I do feel like it's interesting how we're able to form stronger relationships with other people by formulating essentially a favorite of one particular member. Um, and I do appreciate and heard that you zoomed out a bit in your description where you went from the best member to, well, they're all great members. And I think that's a that's a really great sign of growth, right? Where you can be subjective in your personal interest, but then understand that there is an objective nature to how we see the world and that everyone's opinions is valid and unique and that to diminish someone, to diminish someone's point of view, um, there are other ways to do it without having to go that route, right? Um, oh, of course. So I absolutely um, think that you said that story far more tame than what I would anticipate. So <laughs> uh, I'll leave my uh, more passionate outbursts in the past. That's uh, those days are behind me. And that is completely fair because that is how we learn and grow and move on as people. Um, I guess we'll we'll come to this topic now. Uh, speaking of moving on. So we are at the end of the life cycle of this lovely group, Eyes One. They ended their time this week. And I wanted to get your initial thoughts and feelings as it was happening, like the build up towards it. And now that you've had a few days to kind of cope and process. First impressions, nothing but pain which was made worse by the fact that I couldn't just take that time to sit back and reflect. I was revising for an exam the day yesterday. I had a final week finals exam, whatever you would call it in the US. Um, so that kind of made it worse and couldn't made it impossible for me to just kind of move on as fast as I'd hoped especially in the past month kind of leading up to this especially since the concert it's not it's not been easy concert was a emotional time but slowly kind of moving on looking forward to any future endeavors so yeah what's on the horizon for you and following the members like what do you hope for and again you have a bias but will you be following all the members in the future endeavors Without a doubt, I definitely feel like I'm not going to be limiting myself to just kind of one set of members of wherever they go. And I feel like having that kind of connection with these 12 people and whichever branch they go to, you're going to have kind of separate avenues, different groups, so more content for everyone. Everyone's happy. But I definitely feel like hope, hoping for unrealistic, but like a subunit thing uh, with a couple members not in large companies like Starship. Uh, fuck Starship. But they're going to make a group with two of the members. Uh, but for the others, I feel like it's a bit more in the air. They could leave, they could go to a different company, and hopefully, eventually, we get to see a like an IOI reunion, which is coming this year as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I think this ties back into just our, the way that we started the conversation, because I think there there is a cyclical nature with coming of age and growing up in your formative years. The fact that I can listen to Eminem when I was 15, and then you listen to Eminem when you were 15, is a parallel to the life cycle of an Eyes One and an IOI. Because for me, it was IOI. So... They had a very short run. 
Um, I, yeah. I loved all the members, and I can tell you, I still follow all the members today, um, even if they're not as supremely successful as they previously were, or they're doing smaller things, or if their company was shady. Gugudan, Sejong, Mina, I still Ooh. love you guys. Um, and yeah, like I follow Sejong all, everywhere. I, I watch all her dramas. And there was even an, a moment where I thought she was no longer going to do music and I was going to be, and I was fine with that because to me, it's what makes, I, I wanted the best for her and she to, and for her to follow the path that makes her most happy. Um, but she, yeah. she's still doing music and we love her. Hell yeah. And it's, again, it's, it's a life cycle. It's the similarities in just how um, every generation experiences the same ups and downs um and ways in which you change and grow right with the end of eyes one and kind of just like wrapping up the experience all together how has this experience of seeing them grow through the process of being young people young women and now moving into adulthood going off into their own branches and their own paths um how has this resonated with you? And is there a parallel you can draw with your own life? Most definitely. Like, obviously they've all come from a small community. They've been together for two, two and a half years, three years. And now they're going their separate ways. It kind of reflects the thing I'm going through right now. I'm obviously going to be leaving this school community I've been with for the past however many years to go off to university knowing no one none of my friends are coming to the same uni as I am so it's kind of going into the world of the unknown but going into it with a positive outlook like this is the next step and anything that comes of it you just gotta live with it and take what happens so yeah, we shall see what the holds yeah the, uh, the destination is the journey it's... yes uh, there is never a complete end to the road. It's all the experiences and moments you take with you to help you grow as a person, to formulate who you are and your outlook and ultimately how you treat others around you. And I do feel like you yourself um, are a very thoughtful person and have very clearly been able to connect with others in Again, I, I feel like I've said this word like a million times today, but in a very positive way. <laughs> um, and I, I do feel like the, the world does need a little bit more positivity from time to time. And especially during such a difficult period in in history. I mean, it, it does seem like a grand statement to say, but I do think the pandemic and living through something so unique and then just the heightened attention to so many other current events does make it difficult sometimes to turn on the computer and look at a monitor because you may potentially see news that is upsetting. And yeah. K-pop is our escape. And, I, and I'm and i just very appreciative um, that something so literally foreign is now part of our everyday lives. Um, kind of closing everything out in our amazing conversation today, um, how has music been an overall positive for you? Um, I know we talked about that a lot, but are there any things that you want to perpetuate onto the next generation or new K-pop fans that you interact with coming up? Music as a whole is a kind of way to understand emotion, not just of your own or other people, and helps to empathize with the, the struggles of people, the happiness of people. I feel like having that outlook and the understanding not both of not just of yourself but of others is a key part in anyone's life i think having this escape to this different world completely separate from your own is an amazing thing especially in time these stressful times times of like you said the bad news could be just around the corner completely foreign kind of sphere of media available at your fingertips it's just it's just an amazing thing to have and 
if you have an opportunity you should anyone that doesn't i very much doubt there's no one no one does at this point but you, you need to just keep your horizons large with everything you're doing relating to music as well yeah i think it's a it's a great sentiment to uh, to end on there to kind of start off into the horizon seeing the expanse of it and continuing to move forward towards it um Max, this is an excellent conversation. I appreciate having you on today and really going deep into several directions that I wasn't anticipating. <laughs> we, we definitely got there and then we got to uh, the uh, the crescendo of, the, of it all with uh, Eyes One. So, um, yes. yeah, thank you. Thank you again for, uh, for everything. Um, do you have any final words uh, that you'd like to say? Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I don't really have any final thoughts. So just it's been a pleasure to be in here. So... All right. Yes. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, and we'll definitely be chatting again sometime soon. Yes. Thanks to Max and Mina for joining me this week on a special two part edition of the Soju Sessions. Hearing stories from two people worlds away really gave me an appreciation for the universal reach that music and K pop can have to bring people together. We shine a light on our similarities while celebrating our unique histories. The journey is the destination. We're shaped by our experiences and those we meet along the way. The story isn't over, and the journey continues for Max, Mina, and the Eyes One members. Subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify or your preferred podcast platform, and continue the conversation on the Soju Talk K-Pop Podcast Discord. This has been the Soju Talk Nation. I'm Crispy. See you next time. (music) 